Hey, church, Pastor Donovan Katsia has been a friend of this church for over 30 years. Uh, Pastor Donovan Katsia, for those of you that don't know, uh, was the chairman of the Assemblies of God group in South Africa for the past two decades and uh, would come uh, regularly up and preach uh, in this church. In fact, he preached, he used to preach down in the Powery Church when we were down, church was downtown. I wasn't here then. But he used to preach, and then he came to preach here in, when we had church in the kids' church, and he's preached here several times also in this auditorium. He's been a good friend uh, to New Life Church. He stepped down from his position as uh, the chairman of the Assemblies of God group earlier this year, and uh, he's also been dealing with cancer. He's had uh, been through a chemo, a course of chemo, and then just recently started a more intense uh, course as well. Pastor Donovan always brought a message of hope, a message that encouraged, a message that challenged us. And uh, I asked him recently again uh, if he wouldn't please uh, preach another message for us at New Life. And uh, if you know Pastor Donovan, he loves God, he loves the Word, he loves the church, and he loves sharing God's Word. So... I want you to lean into the word this morning, and I believe that it's a word that'll encourage you, it's a word that'll bless you, it's a word that will challenge you, but uh, allow God's word this morning to impact your life, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, hello. It really is good to be with you in New Life Church, and I want to say thank you to Pastor Zane and Erica for the invitation to be able to speak to you today. I really am blessed and honored to be able to do that. Now, you all know that I'm going through certain challenges, and so I have to speak to you from my home. So welcome to my home. And as you can see, I've got a new hairstyle. My hair, after some chemo treatment, has begun to grow back again. But I'm on a new chemo regimen, and they say it'll fall out again. So who knows what'll come out next time? I really don't know. But that's not what's important right now. I know that uh, Pastor Zane introduced me, and introductions are important, although often these pastors are so kind, they say things they shouldn't say. They say more things than they should. But we introduce people because that kind of gives them the opportunity to define who we are to the audience. So there's a kind of definition that you have of me because of the introduction. And we spend our lives defining people. We spend our lives looking at people and defining who they are, what they are. And what we tend to do is most of us, if not all of us, we define people by what they have, what they've got, by their possessions. We define people by their achievements or their lack of achievements, by their successes, their failures, their accomplishments, maybe even by their disfigurements and their disabilities. And we define people by their personalities and their characters. And so not only do we define others like that, but we end up understanding that others define us like that and we define ourselves like that. And the danger with all of that is that we begin to project that onto the way God sees us. Now, that's not a good idea because God does not see us the way we see ourselves. And it's important for us to understand how God does see us, the true us, not the Facebook us or the, uh, what's the other one, Pinterest or Twitter or Instagram us. No, how God sees us. And I want to turn your attention to a little book at the end of the New Testament that's slotted in just before the book of Revelation. It's called the book of Jude or the epistle of Jude, the letter of Jude to the church. And like I said in the beginning, what Jude does is he introduces himself. He defines who he is. Introductions are important. So not only does he define himself and introduce himself, but he also defines the church, defines us, defines those who he's writing to. So he says, I, Jude, a servant of Jesus and a brother of James, to those who are called and loved by God and kept in Jesus Christ. Well, very short, but so much in that little statement, so powerful. First of all, he tells us who he is. He says, I'm Jude, a servant of Jesus and a brother of James. Actually, he's a brother of Jesus. He's also the son of Mary and Joseph. Now, when he says I'm the brother of James, Two of Jesus' brothers actually wrote New Testament books, to, New Testament letters to us. The first one is James, uh, and, and this one is Jude. Both of them came to salvation, came to believe that Jesus was the Messiah after his resurrection. But he doesn't describe himself as the brother of Jesus. He describes himself 
as the servant of Jesus because he understands that Jesus is more than just his brother. He is born of the Virgin Mary and he is begotten of God and he is our savior and Messiah. So he defines himself. This is the family. This is where I come from. This is who I am. And then he defines who he's writing to. He says three things about us, the three words that stand up and I want you to Pay attention to them and I want you to try and remember them as you go home. Three words, just simple, three words. Called, loved, kept. Called, loved, kept. He says to those who are called, beautiful word, used in very many different ways in the New Testament. First of all, it is used to speak of those who are called to perform a duty, to a responsibility. It's, it's about God calling us, selecting us, choosing us for a purpose and the purpose is his purpose on the planet and he's saying I'm giving you a responsibility there is something that you need to do and you're going to have to give an account for it and you know many people today I hear so many sermons about God's got a plan for your life and God's got a plan and God does have a plan for our lives but when I hear those sermons and listen to them it's all about me and my plan and my life let me say this to you God's got a plan you and I have a life we need to make sure that our lives line up with the plan of God. And that's what he's saying when he says we are called, we're selected. None of us is excluded. There are no exclusions here. Every single person is called, no matter your race, your gender, your background, your wealth, your possessions, what part of society you come from. Every one of us is called, but not all of us respond. So we're called to a duty, called to a responsibility, called to a task. That's why Paul often speaks of himself and says, Paul called to be an apostle. A task, a duty, something that he has to perform. However, this word is also used as a, as a word of invitation. So what God is saying is, I'm calling you to a task, to a responsibility. I want you to do something. But at the same time, it's an invitation. It's a joyous thing. The task that I'm asking you to perform shouldn't be a burden. It's an invitation, like an invitation to a celebration. Come and perform this task in celebration with me. It is an absolute joy to be involved with God and to be involved with him in his plan and purpose for this planet. So we've been called, we've been chosen, we've been set aside. None of us has been overlooked. None of us has been discarded. And that's wonderful. I remember being a little boy. I'm now a little man. But I remember being a little boy and playing on the park and we'd take our rugby balls down there and our footballs down there and our baseball bats and cricket bats. And then the two big guys, you know, the, the big boys, the big guns, the, they would end up two guys picking a team and then they'd go, you, and then the other one, you, and all us little pickies would be jumping around saying, me, me, choose me, me. I also want to be in the team. I don't want to be overlooked. And at the end they say, okay, you three go there and you three go there. You didn't mind you were, you were part of the game. But you know, we're not part of God's leftovers. We're selected. He's got his eye on us. We're called. He calls us to perform a duty with some responsibility. And he says it's a joy. It's an invitation to be part of what I'm doing on the planet. Secondly, he says, those who are loved in God. Now, the minute I see that word loved, actually some translations use the words beloved or beloved. And the moment I see that word beloved, my mind goes straight to the baptism of Jesus. When Jesus is being baptized in the river Jordan and he comes up out of the water and heaven opens and the Holy Spirit descends upon him in the form of the dove and God speaks. And he says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. My beloved son. It's the same word that he uses to describe his son Jesus from heaven that he uses to describe us. What a powerful statement. You and I are the beloved of God. That's it. We are the beloved of God. And it's such a wonderful thing to know and to understand. You see, our definitions of love don't really make sense. We love those who love us. We love those who can do something, give something. We think that we earn love. We can say we don't, but we treat one another like in marriage. All our love seems to be transactional, quid pro quo. You do, I do. You don't do, I don't do. That's how we work things out. But 
The love relationship that we have with God is not transactional. It is totally relational. It's got nothing to do with what we can give him. He doesn't love us because we've achieved something. He doesn't love us because we haven't achieved. He doesn't love us because we've got or we haven't got. And I know that's hard for you and for me to understand. And I know it's particularly difficult for those of us who make mistakes and who end up sinning. A Bible word, sinning, falling short of God's standard. And some of us may even have committed sins that we are terribly ashamed of and that we wish no one would ever find out about. And it actually haunts us. And worse than that, it impedes our relationship with God. It impedes our prayer life. We want to pray and we go, oh my word, how can God ever listen to me? God, I've done this. I'm sorry. We, we tend to confess this thing over and over and over and over again. And we can't believe we got there. We can't believe we did that. Why? Because we believe that we have to be so good to receive God's love. No, it's not transactional. It's totally relational. God loves us, the Bible says, before we love them. God loves us, the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, before we fixed anything up. So we need to understand that God loves us in spite of who we are. You see, this love of God is the agape love of God. It's a love that can love the unlovely. It can love the unloved. It can love the unlovely and the unloved in such a way that it can transform the unlovely and make them lovable. And in fact, take it to another level and not only make them lovable, but make them capable of a better kind of love. That's who we are, the beloved. We experience the agape love that is able to change us and make us lovable. In fact, more than that, able to love in the way they need it. You know, when I think of that most incredible verse in the Bible that everybody quotes, that's the most preached verse in the Bible, they say, and that is John three sixteen, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Just think of that for a moment. When I think of this world, when I think of what's going on in the world, when I think of the atrocities, the awfulness, the horror, when I think of what people go through in war and famine, when I think of what people are doing to one another, to children, to all kinds of people, I'm like, oh my goodness me, this is horrendous. And I sometimes hear things and I think if I can lay my hands on that person and, and I shudder at the thoughts that I begin to develop in my mind about my behavior and my actions and so on. And then I think to myself, when this world is as bad as it is and it's at its absolute worst that I'm not even aware of, how does God respond to this world? Well, the Bible tells us how he responds. He responds with love. Love, for God so loved before we loved them, while we were yet sinners. God's response to this horrible world is love. What an amazing thing. In fact, we all know about the judgment that God brought upon the earth in Noah's day. And afterwards, God looked and saw the rainbow, and he, or rather, he put the rainbow in the sky, and he said, this will be a sign, I'll never do this again. I'll never, never do this again. I have to respond in the best possible way, and that's love. And what only does he say, he responds in the best possible way by saying he loves us. He tells us how he loves us. He shows us how he loves us. He gives us the best that what heaven has to offer, the Lord Jesus Christ. So you and I are called, not overlooked. We're chosen, selected with a purpose, with a responsibility into a joyous plan and purpose for the planet. And we are the beloved of God, irrespective of who we are and what we've done and what we've gone through. His love will come through for every single one of us. Thirdly, it says that we are kept in Jesus Christ. Oh, I like that word. We are kept in Jesus Christ. It means preserved. It means looked after, taken care of. God is able to keep us. In fact, the epistle ends up by saying he's able to keep that which we have committed unto him against that day. God is able to take us, hold us, keep us, protect us, preserve us. And when we are faithless, he is faithful. He cannot deny himself and let go of us. That's how powerful this God really is. And we'll never be abandoned or never be left alone. Now, this word kept takes me straight back to the Passover in the book of Exodus. 
Now, when you read that story of the Passover in the book of Exodus, Exodus 12, God says, I want you to put the blood on the lintels and the doorposts. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you so that the angel of death will not be able to harm you. And I want you to listen carefully to that. When I see the blood on the lintel and the doorposts, I will pass over you. Just a bit of symbolism. The animal was sacrificed at the front door and in front of the front door was a little sloot where the rain was led away so that it wouldn't go into the front door. And it was known as a basin. It's an Egyptian word. So the blood was in that sloot in that basin and they would take some hyssop and they would dip it in to the basin, onto the lintel, onto the doorpost. Blood in the form of a cross. The symbolism is clear in terms of what is taking place there. And he says, and when I see that blood, I will pass over you. Now, I always used to think, and I'm sure many people do, that when it says, I will pass over you, we actually in our minds don't read it like that. We read it like this, the angel of death will pass over you. No, the angel of death didn't pass over anyone. In my head, it was the angel of death will come and he'll hop over, skip over, pass over, not touch, just pass by. That's not what it says. It says God will pass over so that the angel of death can't touch. So when we are kept, and the word there is Pesach, which is also not a Jewish word, it's an Egyptian word. Passover Pesach, covering you, protecting you so that the harm cannot come to you. Same concept, he who dwells in the shadow of the Almighty under the wings of the Almighty. Again, we find it in the New Testament. God says that as he, as he laments over Jerusalem, Jesus says, how often I would have gathered you as a mother hen gathers her chickens and passes over them. It's the same word. I want to protect you. I want to look after you. You and I are protected. God passes over us. And when God passes over us, nothing, nothing can get to us. Nothing can steal our faith. We'll experience difficult things, hard things, but nothing can remove us from the love of God. And he is able to keep us and that which we have committed unto him against that day. And so when I look at these three things, I want to say this to you today. That you and I need to rest in the fact that God is able to keep us. I know we're going through difficult times right now. COVID, it's tough. Some people are having to deal with extra stuff in COVID. Some people are having to deal with massive things. You wonder, where's God? Where's God in all of this? Has God abandoned me, forgotten about me? I feel backslidden. I no longer have the joy to read the Bible, to pray. I don't want to worship online. I think I'm losing my faith. No, you are not. God is watching over you. He's able to keep you. He's able to keep you until that day. Now, so often we go to church and so often we hear sermons. You know, every week it's another sermon. None of us can remember 10%, 5% of the sermons we've heard this year. And I mean, they're, up, they're, they're the pastors are grinding it out, sermon after sermon after sermon. We can hardly remember what's been said. So what I want you to do today, I want you to go home. I want you to remember what's been said. I want you to do something. As you leave today, I want you to say, called, loved, kept. I'm called, I'm loved. I'm kept. Think about that for today. Think about that for this week. Understand how God sees you and God sees me. We are called, chosen to a purpose with a responsibility, but with an invitation to a celebration. It's a great joy. We are the beloved of God. And he wants to pronounce his love to us. And we are kept. God's got us. As you say, you young people, he's got our back. He's taking care of us. He's looking after us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I'd like to pray with you. Say if you want to, whatever you want to do, bow your head, open your hands up to God. I want to pray that God would speak to you today as you leave. Dear Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus. Help us to remember that we're called, that we're chosen. We've not been overlooked. You see every one of us. You see every hair on our head. You know what we go through. You know what we do. It doesn't change the way you see us. You call us, you invite us to be part of your purpose. You love us 
with an everlasting eternal love. You love us with a love that can never be earned. There's no quid pro quo here. And you keep us. We're safe. Safe in your arms, safe in your hands. Nothing can separate us, nothing from the love of God. And Lord, I pray that you'd help each person watching, listening today to understand how much you value them, how much you care for them, how much you love them. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'd like to pronounce a benediction, and I want you to listen carefully to this word benediction. It comes from two Latin or Italian words, benedicere, or eulogy, same thing in Latin, you, or in Greek, sorry, eulogy, you, logio. It means to speak good. So I'd like to pronounce a, ben I'd like a benediction. I'd like to say something good from God over your life, if that's okay. And now, may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead that great shepherd of the sheep, the Lord Jesus Christ, equip you with everything which is good for doing his will. And may he work in us that which is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Have a good day. Have a good week. And take care. Amen. Won't you stand in response and let's sing a song of worship to Jesus.
is in his blood. Oh, we lift our voice. Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom come. Oh, we worship come on, your name, the praise Jesus. Of Jesus in his place. Where you are, would we take a moment to respond to God this morning? Respond that we would realize and believe in our hearts that we are called by Him. That we are loved, that we are the beloved of God. And He kept us. He has a plan and a purpose for our lives. So where you stand and let's take a moment to respond to God saying, God, thank you. God, we thank you so much, God. Thank you for Pastor Donovan's word this morning, God. That reminds us that we are loved God we are loved by you we are kept by you we are called by you I pray Jesus for each person standing in this room today God that we would walk out of here with supernatural power filling in our hearts the love of Jesus upon our lives that we would we would walk away today God changed and challenged forever God that we would know today God that we are called by you God that no matter our past no matter what we've done God you have called us and we are loved by you, God. That we are loved beyond measure. That you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to die for us. And we are kept, we are protected by you. So I pray for us, God, as we walk into this week, God, would you use us like never before. Thank you for your love. Thank you that you've called us. And thank you, God, that you keep us. In Jesus' name, everyone says, Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you, would you would you grab your seat? I want to give you the announcements for what's coming up. There's so much happening in church life. I'm, I'm so blessed and privileged that I get to be part of a phenomenal church like this, that there's so many things going on in church life, um, and there's exciting things coming up. And... The, the first one I want to I want to let you know is one of our kids church volunteers Shanice she's probably in kids church serving at the moment she got engaged yesterday so let's make some noise for Shanice she got engaged it's always exciting when when people get engaged as might have as you probably would have seen as well Basil got engaged a few weeks ago um, so there's so many great things happening in church and one of the amazing things that we want to start next year off is something that I'm excited about and our next gen leaders are excited about we have a thing called Summer Fest so Summer Fest is a week long holiday club slash conference slash party with our young people and we believe this church in the next generation and I am so grateful for our leaders Pastor Zane and Pastor Erica who believed in me when I was a great 10 snotty nosed boy that believed in me believed in the next generation and that's why I get to stand here today because of people who believed in the next generation and you and I get to have a part in what God is doing in the next generation because I believe our youth leaders believe that the next generation our kids all the way from primary school all the way to our matrix they are our future leaders of our country they are our next presidents our next leaders our next doctors and lawyers and preachers and church planters and you and I get to invest into that so Holiday Club is happening next year. Summer Fest Conference is happening next year from the 11th to the 15th. And I want to invite you along on the journey. I want to invite you along. We're calling out for volunteers today. People who say, I want to be part of this. I want to serve either at this or I want to give financially into this. I want to get ready to see what God's going to do with the next generation. So I want to encourage you, if you want to get involved with this in any way, with either being part of the team here during that week or either giving into it or helping with the team that's going to be decorating or whatever it might be you can get involved in any capacity whenever you are available there's a spot for you to come and serve and get involved so afterwards at the information desk if you want to get involved please pop in there we have an information desk team who would love to welcome you and give you a form that you could fill in and the second one is our Christmas boxes unfortunately as you know COVID messed a lot of things up this year but one of the things we don't want it to mess up is heart to hearts Christmas boxes so Heart to Heart for the past 17 years, they've been doing a Christmas party and quite a few of you have already been part of it. We get to have fun with the kids at Milkwood and have a party with them and jumping castles and foam and all these games. But because of COVID, unfortunately, we cannot do that this year. But you and I still get to be part of what God wants to do. And you and I get to give to them. And what we've been doing is we've been collecting money to buy a shoebox for them with their 
with some clothes and sweets and snacks and toys and all of these things. We want to give them a Christmas present. I believe we are so blessed to have what we have, the clothes that we have, the cars that we drive, the food on our table. And you and I get to give as well into the less fortunate and the less underprivileged kids. So how you can do that is you could give any amount of money. One box costs 300 Rand, but you could give any amount of money. You could give a 50 Rand, a 20 Rand, whatever it is. Or you can give somebody I know recently bought 10 boxes. And if you're in a space where you can do that, I want to encourage you, would you do that as well? So at the information desk, you could give today. And let's be part of what God is doing here in our community amongst young people. And the last one that I have for you today is we have the, our LX program, which is called our Leadership Experience Program. And there's a bunch of people that's sitting in this room that was part of the Alex team. There was, that's Candy sitting there at the back. And we have Lauren here as well. I was also part of it. Edgar was part of it. And what the Alex program is, it's called a leadership experience. And you and I get to come to church for a year. It's a year of your life gap that you take. And you say, God, I want you to use me this year. So if you're in school or if you are a young adult, or even if you're not working at the moment, if you want to say, God, I want to be part of team for a year. And you get to come onto team here at church and you get to work behind the scenes get to see what God's doing and the three things we believe is we want to empower you to lead we want to educate you in theology and we want to see God do and equip you to do what only he can do through your life so if you want to be part of the Alex team or the leadership experience team for 2021 our applications are open so at the information desk we have a team who would give you a flyer if you know anybody who thinks that they want to maybe take a gap year next year or invest a year of their life into the kingdom of God would you let them know as well and the and the exciting thing today is we have strawberries I'm going to eat one to let you know how good it tastes we have strawberries on sale because it is so good. Imagine having a conversation and you can just get to eat a pound of strawberries. Come on, somebody. Joy, don't you want to take a strawberry and eat one? Pass it along to the front row, man. These strawberries are phenomenal. And we are selling strawberries. Heart to Art is selling strawberries for fun. Let me just take another bite. These strawberries are phenomenal. So Heart to Heart got blessed with a thousand punnets of strawberries, which is a lot. Our The church smells like strawberries everywhere. And we are selling strawberries for fundraising for Heart to Heart today. Um, there's, a, there's a desk right at the back. So a punnet like that costs for uh, 25 Rand. But if you want to buy a box with 16 punnets, it only costs you 200 Rand. So you could buy strawberries and give to everyone in your street. These straw... They are so good. People who's watching online, come to church next week, buy a pound of strawberries. So I want to encourage you, buy some strawberries for heart, fundraising for Heart to Heart. And we get to be part of what God's doing through Heart to Heart. So I want to encourage you, buy a pound that's only 25 Rand. Or you can buy a whole box with 16 pounds for only 200 Rand, which costs you, I think it's 13 or 14 Rand a pound. So I've said a lot, but the last thing I want to say before I dismiss you for some good coffee and cake is, we have the privilege to give into God's kingdom. We believe here in giving into God's kingdom, our tithes and our offerings. Our tithes is the first 10% of our income that we give to God. Not, it doesn't belong to us, it belongs to God. And the second part is our offerings, where we get to give above and beyond our 10%. One of the statements that I love, it says that great miracles of tomorrow start with generosity of today. Great miracles of what's going to happen tomorrow or in the future starts with generosity of us today. So I encourage you, would you give and would you give generously, generously today? As you leave, either through the courtyard exit doors or to the back to grab a cup of coffee, our frontline team is there. You can either pop your money in there or there's ways to give onto the screen, either via SnapScan or via EFT. And I want to say thank you so much for being here. Thank you for taking time out of your Sunday and waking up early and being here at my favorite crowd, the 8 o'clock, which is super early for church. But thank you so much for being here. Have an amazing week. We'll love you so much. Don't just leave after this because today is the perfect weather for some good coffee and a good cupcake. So after service, coffee is for free. So head through that. Doors are going to open right now. You're going to open, they're going to open up the doors and you can go grab a cup of coffee. Or if you need to fetch your kids, you can either go and fetch them from Kids Church. But the only exit to leave our premises is through the courtyard door because of all the COVID protocols. So you can go grab a cup of coffee or fetch your kids and bring them and grab some coffee and a nice cupcake. And then you can leave through that doors. Have an amazing week. Keep shining for Jesus. And we love you so much. And thank you so much for being here today.